What up, everybody, and welcome to the State of Wild episode 14, a regular podcast YouTube video web series thing. As usual, we've got Corbett Games joining us tonight. Corbett, how are you doing, friend? I'm doing fantastically. Um, it's going to be a fun episode. I'm really looking forward to this one. So, yeah, I hope you all enjoy. Uh, Meath, how are you today? I am doing pretty well. Uh, we were talking a little bit before the show about our sleep schedules, and uh, I just want to say I'm very thankful that coffee exists. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so as Corbett kind of mentioned, uh, we're going to be starting something a little bit neat today. Um, uh, and something that we want to do for the last episode of every month. Uh, and so today what we're planning on doing is talking about how the overall meta has shifted over the past month. Uh, allowing us to kind of look at the meta over a longer period of time and, and analyze and think about how the meta has changed. And we'll also be doing like a class and archetype breakdown and, uh, you know, attack the meta from a few different perspectives. And so let us know in the comments below what you guys think about the format of this episode and, and feedback about how we can improve it if you guys do enjoy it. And just before we get started, uh, a reminder to leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you guys enjoy content like this. And, and with that, let's go ahead and get started. So like we mentioned, we're going to be doing a, a big meta breakdown uh, for the, the month of September. And so let's first talk about what information we're pulling from uh, as the basis of a lot of the discussion we're going to be having tonight. Uh, because the wild player base is much smaller than the standard player base, we don't really have sources like HS Replay or Vicious Syndicate, uh, VS Live. To, so we have to do this the old-fashioned way. Uh, and mm -hmm. so this is obviously not the most optimal way to collect data, but it's kind of the only way we really could do it. That's and what we've got. Yep. Yeah, it's what we've got, so we're going to make it work. Um, so basically, Corbett and I have gone through all of our replays. We both use a deck tracker. Uh, we we took a lot of our time and, and looked through all of our replays. So this is about 700 games between the both of us um, since the Dark Learner. So this is about 700 games in about two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. And while it's not representative of all the games being played at Legend, um, we believe it's enough to have a solid grasp on what's strong in the metagame and the role that you know decks might be playing. Uh, and so for those of you guys that are on mobile or listening um, to the podcast, we apologize in advance. We will be showing a lot of charts to kind of represent the data. Uh, and while we will be doing our best to describe what's happening, if you can't see it, um, you know, we, we aren't going to touch on everything and we can't touch on everything. So if you guys want to see some of this, uh, you know, some of these charts or the data that we're talking about, they will all be included in the show notes down in the description. So if you guys just click the, the bit link, it'll take you to a Google Doc with all the information. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about the meta as a whole. So the first image that's going to pop up on y'all's screen is, so this is the Vicious Syndicate live class representation. So this is the best kind of holistic representation we can have about the wild metagame at Legend. Mm -hmm. And so this is for the month of September, over 7,200 games since the Dark Lord nerf. Now the image at the bottom is just data collected by Corbett and myself, so about 700 games, so about a tenth of the sample size. But uh, I will say, Corbett is top 10 legend, and I'm about rank 100, 150 for most of the month. So maybe represent representative of what you might call high legend, right? It's completely arbitrary, but... Uh, so the first impression, just looking at these two graphs, uh, is that as you get higher on the legend ladder, you're seeing a trend of, you know, the top four classes seeing an up uptick in play, right? Which mm -hmm. is com makes complete and total sense. At higher ranks, you're playing the best decks, because you want to win, this you know, less experimentation, the the more unrefined stuff tends to get pushed out. But yeah, what are, what other big immediate impressions do you have just looking at kind of class representation? Uh, well, like you said, um, as you move up to the high ranks, things kind of gravitate towards the most popular uh, classes. Like this happens all the time. It, this isn't like unique to this current format, this current meta. Um, it's something that you see a lot of the time in standard as well, where the you know as you move up into the highest ranks, like the the weaker classes get more and more pushed out. Right? People just need to keep playing what's winning, and there's less experimentation and less unrefined stuff things to play. Um, so in terms of like the most popular stuff, what we're seeing, um, I know that it can be a little bit alarming to kind of look at, look, look at those massive chunks that some of these decks, are, at least some of these classes are taking up in the meta, right? Like you see Mage, Warlord, Druid, Priest, like these are making up very, very large chunks of the meta. But it's actually very similar to like what's seeing like happening in Standard right now. The biggest thing that stands out right now is that because basically two classes are dead, uh, Demon Hunter and Hunter, it means that the other eight classes really have larger chunks that they can kind of get a hold of. Um, and in standard, it's the case where Shaman 
and uh, Warlock are very uh, lowly represented. Um, so it's actually a very, very similar case in Standard where the top six classes in Standard at top 1k Legend are seeing about 86% of uh, overall representation uh, according to Vicious Syndicate. And the data that you and I have collected, um, the top six classes are about 90%. So it's very similar. Um, and yeah, this is about, you know, like overall, um, it is interesting that it's not really dominated by one class in particular. Like uh, even the most popular classes, we're all seeing relatively even chunks, right? Where we have Mage at 20, War 20, Druid, just a bit below that, Priest a little bit below that. Um, and so, yeah, overall, like uh, I know it's a, it's a bit of a shame to see Hunter and Demon Hunter and stuff this lowly represented, but I don't think it's a an extreme situation. And um, it's actually relatively diverse, all things considered. Yeah, so you mentioned like at High Legend, we're seeing six classes be about 90% of the metagame. If we're looking just kind of legend at whole, right, with the VS data, it's it's not nearly as alarming, right? Mage is at 20%, Warlock right. kind of drops down to 15 Druid at 13 Priests at 15 Rogues at 10 So it makes complete and total sense. And again, this is nothing new, right? This is exactly how you mentioned, like, it's exactly like it is in Standard. Uh, this is what other metas in the past have looked like in Wild. Um, I <laughs> Like, unbalanced metagames, like when Snip Snap Warlock was a thing, you know, Warlock was way more than twenty percent of the meta game, right? Mm -hmm. Even even when we yeah. had like the Quest Mage and, and uh, Darkest Hour meta game, right? That those were two classes that represented almost fifty, sixty percent of the meta game. Okay. Yeah, I I remember I did something very similar to this at the end of last expansion, and Mage by itself was a lot closer to forty percent. Like Ma Mage was forty yeah. percent. So the fact that right now we're seeing things, it's a lot more even spread between the classes. But um, you know, class representation is one thing. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll dig in deeper into the individual archetype representation as we go through this. Well, yeah, let's go ahead and start doing that. So let's talk about archetypes. So uh, the first pie chart that you're going to see, so this is uh, archetype breakdown. So this is essentially what Corbett and I spent a chunk of our time doing, uh, looking through our replays, figuring out mm -hmm. what exactly we were playing against. So yeah, you see Mage is 20%, 21% of the metagame at, at High Legend. But that's split off over four archetypes, right? So it's not yeah. one class that's 20%. And so I know I've kind of made this hyperbole before. We're like, all I'm seeing is quest mage. Like, I'm seeing a lot of mage, yeah, but it's not quest mage, right? Not all mm -hmm. of it's quest mage. Um, so let's talk about the archetypes uh, and whether or not they're surprising. So most popular archetypes, I think we have three that are or four, I would say, that are above and beyond kind of the other archetypes in terms of popularity, mm -hmm. right? So we've got Rena Priest, which is not surprising. Uh, Discard Warlock, which is not really surprising. Aggro Druid, which might be surprising to a few people. And then Quest Mage. And <clears throat> what's, what's really been interesting is, so if you guys are looking at the line graph now, which is kind of talking about, uh, it, it's displaying how the popularity has changed over the, the 20 days since the nerf. Yeah. Um, at the very beginning, we saw, you know, I think the podcast that we recorded right after the nerfs, we felt like, wow, it feels like a brand new expansion. There's so many <laughs> new decks out there, and that's that's yeah. kind of what it felt like because a lot of people were playing decks that had been suppressed for such a long time, and then people realized, well, damn, Quest Mage is still really, really good, right? And so you see that increase in popularity as time goes on, and then it kind of you know stabilizes at about sixteen percent. Yeah, um, it's exactly what you were saying. How that, that I remember that very first podcast we recorded, how it, things felt so fresh and it felt like such a weight had been kind of lifted off people's shoulders with Dark Lair being nerfed and people were kind of free to play or whatever. And it is interesting that like those feelings were really backed up in going through this kind of um, all the data ourselves and exactly what we were seeing. And we can see that Reno Priest uh, between the two of us was much, much lower, uh, had a much, much lower representation compared to where it is now. Um, it didn't, it, again, like at the time we predicted that, you know, people would catch on to Reno Priest and, and things like that and things would uh, settle relatively quickly, um, which has happened, right? Reno Priest, you can you guys can see that um, spike where Reno Priest initially when the uh, the patch happened, Reno Priest was about 10%. Now it's kind of settled in for Meowth and I together at about 16, 17 in that kind of range. Um, but yeah, you can see how a lot of the more popular or the stronger archetypes have typically kind of like moved up over time. Um, and the, yeah, there's a couple of interesting things, I think, that stand out immediately when you see the graph. Uh, the biggest thing that kind of stands out to me is that 
Reno Galaxy Mage um, and, in, and Turtle Mage have kind of had this weird inverse relationship. Yeah. Which I think has been really fun to kind of... When, when we noticed this, I thought this was like really interesting. Yeah, it's just like one of the small little nuggets that we get when you look at uh, our data like this. Um, the fall of Pocket Galaxy Mage coinciding with the rise of Turtle Mage. And while we don't know why that might be, like maybe all the LPG Mage players are just like, hey, let's play this brand new archetype, right? I don't, I don't know what exactly that was, but it's it's very interesting to see maybe if they had a relationship with each other. I mean, yeah. looking, at, looking at this pie chart for a second, though, so we talked about like the big four, but behind it, there's a smattering of like 10 to 12 decks. And I, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to go and spend all the time naming them, but uh, there are decks that you're like familiar with on ladder, right? LPG Mage, Odd Rogue, Kingsbane, J Druid, even all, all these other decks that you're like super familiar with on ladder are all in there. Um, and so, mm -hmm. kind of one of the big takeaways for me is like, while we might only have like five or six classes in the meta game, supposedly, right? Six classes being about ninety percent, the meta actually feels very diverse when it comes to the types yeah. of decks present, right? We have control decks we have combo decks we have aggro decks we have mid-rangey decks um with like even shaman and like j druid right uh we have a bit of everything that seems to be seeing play which is cool right so like yeah arena priest is the, the focal point okay mm -hmm. and deservedly so but there there are archetypes uh whatever your favorite archetype might be it has kind of a place in the metagame Absolutely, yeah. There, there is, uh, like I said, all, all that kind of variety. Um, we will get into our, like, you know, what our individual impressions were, uh, but it's been interesting coming together and putting our data together and seeing exactly the, the larger scope of what exactly has been seeing play. Um, and like you said, it's very diverse. Uh, right now, um, I know there's been, like, a lot of questions and a lot of people kind of asking, like, hey, what's the best deck? Hey, what's really good? I, I know Tempo Storm, uh, to, to name drop, they, they did their tier list and they had, like, uh, I think I had two decks in tier one and then they had a ton of decks in tier two. Yeah. And I think it's very easy to see why that kind of uh, perception existed because you are seeing a relatively diverse uh, field outside kind of Rena Priest and then things kind of drop off and, and it's really a mixed bag of stuff. And it's very easy to see, like you're saying, with these aggro control, there's kind of a large variety outside that, um, outside that like focal point of Rena Priest. Yeah. Um, and you can see that there are like a lot of different types of viable competitive decks. There's so many times where people ask uh, like, oh, what about this? What about this? And I'm like, yeah, it's competitive. Yeah, it's good. Like, yeah, you get legend viable. Um, and that it feels like right now you do have a ton of options and a ton of different directions that you can go in. Yeah, kind of relating to like our topic from last week where we talked about like maybe signs of like a, a supposedly healthy metagame where like you can play whatever deck suits your playstyle, your interests, because it feels like um, mm -hmm. any of these archetypes, like you said, are, are competitive, they're viable. And so whatever you feel like playing, it feels like you can't play. You're not limited in what you're allowed to play, which is awesome. Sure. Uh, but yeah, so we, we kind of wanted to take a little bit and dive into our individual um, meta representations. And so, uh, for a little bit of context, Corbett streams um, around 3 p.m. Eastern time every day, and I stream about 5 p.m. Eastern time every day. Okay, um, Corbett is in top 10 legend. I'm at top 100 legend, so our ranks aren't drastically different. We play around the same times every day, uh, but the differences in what we are actually playing against, like our local metas, are actually surprisingly very different. Um, yeah, and so. I who knows whether it's variance or the difference between just that many ranks actually mattering a significant amount who knows but it, it's it's very surprising for example you're seeing so much discard warlock and aggro druid so much uh so yeah. your most played against archetype is actually discard warlock at 15 percent of the metagame where i'm looking at the amount of discard warlocks that i've played and it's like the sixth most played deck right it's all the way down there at five percent which is <laughs> insane it's crazy yeah yeah, this was this is like probably the most interesting thing that really came out of being able to go through all the data from the games that we had. Um, seeing that, like you said, we play at very similar times and stuff. We're not really that different in terms of rank. Like we have a lot of overlap uh, potentially with our opponents. But this was fascinating to me to see that even though we do have those sort of heavy similarities, our like the differences in the meta, are, uh, you know, quite striking, right? Like overall, yeah. they are relatively similar. Like we are seeing very similar amounts of Reno Priest. We are seeing um like similar amounts of other archetypes and stuff like it's not like you're not seeing any aggro druid 
Um, but it is interesting, right, that these differences exist where I'm seeing 15% discard, you're seeing 5%. I'm seeing nearly twice as much aggro druid as you have over these 320 games, over these, like, um, you know, like, this, this isn't a particularly small sample, you know? Like, yeah. this is a substantial amount of games at similar ranks. And this is, like, so interesting to me. Um, and I think, like, the big takeaway from me, uh, I thought these numbers were gen generally going to be a lot closer. Like, it seemed very strange to me that Discard Warlock would make up such a large percentage of my games and, uh, like, a decent but not particularly high number for yours. Um, and this is so interesting to me because it just highlighted, really, how tough it is as one individual or even just a couple individuals to kind of get a really un like a clear understanding of the meta as a whole you know it's so so difficult for one player to really understand what everyone else is experiencing and it really highlighted how when we have these conversations about hey what's really good hey what's seeing play we, we are really coming at them from very different um perspectives because our experiences are different you know even though we're playing at very similar ranks and stuff similar time zones we are seeing slight differences in um what's good and stuff so i'm seeing a lot more aggressive stuff than you um I'm seeing a bit less quest mage, you know. To me, I would describe the meta as fairly aggressive. You, you personally, you're seeing mostly Reno priests, seeing a lot of quest mage, um, galaxy mage. Just me, out's third most seen archetype since the uh, since the patch. You know, it's a it's a relatively different meta, and it makes like these conversations that we have. Um, it really highlights why people can often have very different opinions and, it, and no one's necessarily wrong you know like people come at the stuff and it's not like people are clueless it's just like we have different experiences and stuff and of course we're going to have different opinions based on those yeah very well said I, it's for those of you guys that want a little bit more context before we even started recording when we started analyzing this data i was like okay well like what's the big takeaway from this archetype distribution and corbett immediately was like mm -hmm. damn this ladder is super aggressive and i was like what <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm like looking at mine i'm like i see a lot of reno decks i see q block i see j druid like where, where's mm -hmm. where are these aggro decks and then look at his pie chart and it's all disco world and aggro druid, so it makes a little bit more sense but yeah it so i think maybe another big picture is like it you have to kind of take that into account when you're discussing the metagame i think is the big thing right don't be like yeah. all right you're just wrong because just because i'm seeing a ton of aggro decks right that means the the meta is aggressive and those are the best decks in the format we're like that's just your experience and it, it's very hard to represent kind of you know the entire metagame based upon the experience of like a couple individuals which is like why it's really interesting to to look at you know our our data and we're not saying that our data is representative of everything you know, the metagame at all like it's it's absolutely no. far from that but it's yeah. it's interesting like the differences between ours, right? Even though we play at the same time, but also how they relate to kind of this overall metagame that we're seeing mm. when we combined our data, you know? And and to me, um, again, this really under underlines just how important I think that like data collection and this kind of resource mm. that we get, whether it's like a HS replay, whether it's like a vicious syndicate, um, because like, because like when you get that big large sample that's when you get that nice clear picture and it, like we said it's just so tough as an individual um and i'm sure like if meowth and i each kept on playing um you know we we played more games throughout the month i'm sure these numbers would look a lot closer but exactly where they match up and where they pair uh we don't really know do we like we don't know what the quote-unquote like true discard warlock representation is on ladder uh for yeah. the month you know um and so yeah it, it's been interesting i think going through this and kind of underlining just how important that is and uh yeah not really what i was expecting which has been cool yeah like one person single-handedly i don't think can ever play enough games to get a solid grasp of what is that the a challenge meta? Do you want to play a couple thousand games? Go for it. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Um, but yeah, I mean, so like no data collection from like HS We Play or Vicious Syndicate or whatever. None of that data collection is going to be perfect, right? It all has its flaws, but I think inherently there's value there, mm -hmm. right? When analyzed properly or talked about properly. But I mean, I, I, I think it's useful. And I think people dismissing, you know, huge like large sample size because it doesn't fit with my view of the metagame is you know just don't do it you know um but yeah so we've we've talked big picture and so now we want to come at analyzing the metagame from a little bit of a different perspective so what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be talking through each class and, and talking about what decks are, are present from those classes in the metagame and what role they play in the metagame 
Uh, and then some potential sleeper decks or sleeper strategies that are available to the class that aren't really seeing play or might just need a little bit of help to kind of get over the line and see play. So, mm-hmm. you know, kind of archetypes to keep an eye on with future expansions and future support. So uh, we're going to go in order. So let's start with Demon Hunter. And man, poor, poor Demon Hunter. Aww. Yeah, it's kind of sometimes difficult to remember that Demon Hunter used to have one of the best decks of all time, right, on release odd Demon Hunter. Um, and that deck, I think, I don't know the specific number, but I'm pretty sure it's had more than half of its cards nerfed, right, in, in the yeah, that five sounds, months. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, about more than half, yeah. Yeah, and so in our personal sample size, this is about 700 games. Corbett and I saw one Demon Hunter. <laughs> one. And it wasn't even an odd Demon Hunter, okay? It was somebody playing aggro Demon Hunter. Oh, Damn, man. how the mighty have fallen. It's insane. Yeah. So um that's that's <laughs> actually just an insane stat, right? Like seven like nearly seven hundred games and we saw one Demon Hunter. That like that is insane. Yeah, so Odd Demon Hunter used to be one of the best aggressive decks in the format. And a meta that has, you know, many aggressive decks currently thriving, like why why is Odd Demon Hunter struggling? Is it because can you can it be tied back single handedly to this nerf uh, of Warglaves and the fact that it now really struggles to, to come back and it doesn't have a way to kind of vomit on the board and secure its position from ahead? Um, I don't know. I, I think that the Warglaves nerf was, you know, it's obviously quite significant, mm-hmm. but I think the Old Demon Hunter was actually kind of okay. Like it was, it was pretty decent even after that nerf happened. Um, it dropped off a lot in play rate, but I thought it was okay. Um, I think the bigger deal is that Old Demon Hunter picked up basically nothing from this mm-hmm. expansion. Like, nothing like there was no significant better than replacement cards i mean you could talk about the um a couple of like fringe inclusions and stuff that were maybe better than something else but nothing that really tipped it over the edge right and demon hunter um because that's such it has such a limited card pool right like the fact that it got nothing and it was basically relying on one set um and a neutral pool really really just didn't help uh, the situation at all um i think that uh overall like it's here power should in theory still be very very strong but the fact that it has this big glaring hole in the mid game since the warglaves nerf happened and that wasn't really addressed in any way it didn't help um the fact that the demon hunter set was largely centered around soul cards which you cannot play in demon hunter right it basically in lost wild, the yeah. expansion in wild at least you can't yeah. play it in odd demon hunter specifically because they're even costed um, so yeah, it's the fact that it, it was a, it was kind of, uh, it was an art that needed to be nurtured, you know, it needed, needed something and it just didn't get anything that it needed. Um, it also, you know, like, it, it's not just the fact that it's like not as strong anymore, but, um, the types of decks that similar decks, uh, have really popped up that have kind of, um, over or like replaced it essentially we often talked about last expansion how odd rogue was actually okay but didn't exist because demon hunter was there now odd rogue is very very good it got a whole bunch of new stuff it's very powerful and now demon hunter is kind of useless so it's redundant and it's a bit weaker so yeah odd demon hunter still has really nice pieces right the baku hero power is busted mm-hmm. um but it's just not there right now so we'll see what happens in the future but poor demon hunter is very very sad right now it's it, quite, it quite went upsetting. from hero it went from hero to zero in the span of like <laughs> a month and a half it's yeah. it's yeah. A sad sad story um, but yeah let's let's move on to druid um so yeah druid uh so aggro druid is the most popular druid archetype um the deck kind of exploded right once the dark land of happened people were kind of raring to go and use a whole bunch of the new druid cards um Druid as a whole is one of the more represented classes. Uh, so it's not like it's just seeing aggro Druid. You also have the other combo archetypes that are quite popular with Malagos and Togwaggle. And, you know, even J Druid now has also been another class that has really been popping up a lot more since the nerf as people have kind of tested a whole bunch of things like with Guardian Animals. So, uh, yeah, Meowth, what is your general impression of Druid? Like, how do you feel about the, the class right now as a whole and how it's been looking in the post Dark Lair world? I mean, I think Druid has been one of the big benefactors uh of the mm-hmm. the dark layer nerf so aggregate kind of exploded onto the scene and i'm not really sure why that is um my initial instinct it's 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 one of those decks where if they have the nuts no deck can really deal with it right including arena priest which is this supposedly very anti-aggro like class and, and deck mm-hmm. as a whole and so if the aggregate has the nuts it it could beat any deck um and it's really quick game, so that, like I think that has a big contributing factor. Um, yeah. So it beats Quest Mage, and then the Nuts can beat Reiner Priest, and I think that has a big role to play. Um, for me, I'm surprised at kind of 
the lack of combo druid. Uh, so interesting. Yeah, looking at our our, our data set, we saw about three percent Malagos druid and almost zero dogwaggle druid. And so, like I know a couple weeks ago, we kind of touted Malagos druid as like this potential sleeper counter to Reno priest, right? Because Lucia um, is not super effective at dealing with the combo. Yeah, at disrupting the combo, and you know Malagos druid's pretty you know resilient to dirty rap. And so I, I'm really wondering why it's not seeing more play than it currently is. Um, I don't know if you have any insight on that. Yeah, I think it's just because priest, the priest population isn't quite as high as it needs to be to really yeah. validate the archetype. You know, um, Malagos, like ever since the Kale nerf, I think it's really been hurting a ton in, against the aggressive archetypes. Yeah. Um, it also didn't really help that the... Um, Mali didn't really get anything that interesting, I think, from... Well, it did get Lightning Bloom. I take that back. Lightning Bloom <laughs> um, and did get Studies, Lightning right? Bloom. Yeah. yeah, so it did get actually significant upgrades. But I think with the Kale nerf, um, the the matchups with aggro just hurt so much, and there's just not quite enough priest uh, and enough like things for it to really feast on in the meta. Um, so I'd assume that's why. I still maintain that it is kind of an important deck and that it can keep priest in check, which you know is quite crucial right now, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. This isn't really that shocking to me that it hasn't really completely taken off um, because we do have other counters like Quest Mage, right? Quest Mage has been seeing a significant amount of play and it kind of competes with Quest Mage in that kind of role. Yeah. Um, and I know we get a, I get a lot of questions at least about like Malagos versus Togwaggle when it comes to the combo slot. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, just my two cents on, on Togwaggle Druid. So Togwaggle Druid feels a lot weaker into Priest because it's a lot yeah. easier to disrupt with Dirty Rat and, and Lucia. Um so it feels a lot weaker into Priest, but it feels actually a lot better into um, like Reno Mage and Turtle Mage because okay. you can just yoink their deck and yoink their combo and they can't really do anything. Uh, whereas Mali Druid, yeah. they have the issues with Ice Lock. Um, and so I think like that's the one plus that Ta Waggle Druid has going for it. Uh, I think in general, I don't, I don't know if Combo Druid needs kind of like a looking at its, you know, core structure of how you build the deck to see if there's a way that we can include stuff like guardian animals uh and that mm -hmm. accompanying package because i feel like we'll talk a little bit about this in jade druid but that feels like it's one of the easiest ways to kind of scam an aggro matchup is by getting out at an early guardian animals and just completely taking over the board off of that one card um and i haven't really looked at it so i'm not sure if you can or how you would build it but i think i mean like like i agree with you that it's weakest matchup is aggro and that's kind of what's holding it back um, but I wonder if there are ways to build the deck and kind of address that weakness. Yeah, often the combo slots take up so many, you know, the combo cards take up so many slots that it's yeah. kind of tough to fit everything you really want in these combo druid archetypes. And that kind of holds it back a little bit. I think if, you know, you could fit eight, like if you want 38 cards, like if that was the the restriction that we had to have, we needed 38, then druid would be kind of laughing. It would be having a great time. Um, whereas other classes might struggle. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you about Togwaggle and... Uh, it largely seeming pretty inferior, I think, overall, even though it does have its uh, potential benefits over Malagos. Yeah, and then, and then we talked a little bit about Guardian Animals. I want to talk about Jade Druid a little bit because, damn, Jade Druid yeah. feels like it's a real deck. It feels really, really strong in the metagame. Um, it's gone mm -hmm. a little bit of, like, undergone a little bit of a renaissance, and people widespread have kind of given up on Kael'thas and, and, like, the pure spell package and are adopting good stuff like oaken summons guardian animals mana cheat yeah. recruit it's amazing um and i think the biggest thing and the reason why it feels so much better to me than like the previous versions is because it allows you to be proactive um yeah and being proactive in this game is something that's i think the wild community in general just like continues to underrate and the ability to be proactive with tempo um mm -hmm. guardian animals is a it's a really good card i don't not know how this is not bonkers in standard <laughs> Because if it's mm. pretty damn good and wild, I, I don't understand how it's not. But oh, it is. Yes. <laughs> but uh, like the combination of like Oaken Summons and Guardian Animals and Spreading Plague and Malfurion make the aggro matchups actually seem like fairly winnable, even without stuff like Poison Seeds or Starfall, which is really mm. weird to say. Um, and then it has a really good matchup into Priest, in my experience, because the ability to put out a ton of pressure, like consistently throughout the game, like. I think J Druid is like sleeper top tier and should be seeing a hell of a lot more play than it currently is. I think it's really, really good. 
Yeah, I'm not quite there with you in terms of the top tier, but um, I, I have been very much impressed with uh, some of the new approaches. And it really, it's transitioning a lot more from, like previously it would be like pretty clearly defined as like a control archetype. And mm. now we're kind of drifting more into, you know, like it's subjective, but more like mid range territory, right? Like you're running a mo lot more proactive mid game, exactly like you said. Um, something I'm intrigued by is the idea of like, hey, do the Jade cards even matter that much anymore? Like, can we replace like Jade Idol, Jade Blossom for dragons and stuff? The, the you know, in an ideal in an ideal world, I think like you really want to be playing Breath of Dreams and um, at, like right now you're kind of limited on dragons that you want to play. But yeah, I think like good stuff, Druid, <laughs> it just seems really tempting right now with the Oakens and Guardians package. So uh, Druid's something that I'm really keeping an eye on um, and I would be interested to see how you know, like Jade Druid, like if it transitions away from the actual Jade cards themselves. Yeah, I will say, in my experience, I think the Jades have never been a factor, right? I feel like you run the one copy of a Jade Owl because it's Jade Druid. Yeah. But like the 90% of the games that I'm playing, like it doesn't matter. I'm playing it to avoid fatigue damage, not really caring yeah. about the idols themselves. And so I want, yeah, maybe maybe Breath of Dreams and like, I think the the big limiting factor to me when it comes to like Breath of Dreams, the dragons. Like, yeah, people are running Emerald Explorer, yeah. or whatever the card is, like the four A dragon, and that's just like not good enough for Wild. So yeah, um, but yeah, I think J Druid is definitely one of those decks to keep an eye on uh, moving yeah, forward. Yeah, Druid, big winner, big winner since the nerfs have happened for yeah, sure. Absolutely, uh, Hunter. <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about Hunter? Well, it can be a short one. Um, <laughs> okay, so Hunter, not the least represented class that we saw. Insane. Um, it's crazy. Good for good for Hunter, right? We saw it a total of three times, which beat out Demon Hunter. However, uh, unlike Demon Hunter, this isn't exactly a new situation for Rexa. Um, well, you know, Hunter definitely has seen its moments at times with things like even Hunter popping up here and there. Reno Hunter popped up and sparked, you know, there was a bit of spark and interest in that. Um, Hunter has for a long time kind of been one of the most limited classes in Wild. I do think that, you know, there are, you know, it's, it's not really seeing any major play right now, but there are like potentially you know like i say hunter and you can probably name some archetypes right that are at least playable if you had to take something to ladder mm -hmm. um so you know it has have sort of these these um you know like these archetypes are kind of there they just don't quite have enough whether it's highlander like whether it's even whether it's odd whether it's beast whether it's egg there's kind of a lot of potential stuff um but nothing's quite there for wild right now i think the biggest issue with hunter and wild is the fact that it doesn't like cheat enough mana it's got a bunch of really cool archetypes a bunch of really cool synergies a bunch of really cool cool decks but it just can't compete with with the mana cheat available to other classes in this format always it just always feels a little too fair yeah that's, that's i think the that's the big to, yeah and so like while it's really really good in standard all the time it's just it's not anywhere near competitive enough for wild in my opinion like reno hunter i feel like the best way to build reno hunter is like as a tempo reno deck and mm -hmm. it just feels like it's not it's not good enough <laughs> as weird as that is to say like it's got good yeah. cards they just don't work together well enough i mean even the even in odd decks like i hunter has that issue with its its hero power is not good for tempo it's not good in the aggressive mirrors and so yeah it's a big like automatically it's going to be unfavorable into the other even and odd decks no matter what um which really sucks i mean if we get some more like even hunter support like specific to hunter i think maybe mm -hmm. you can consider even hunter because i think that was like a deck once upon a time when quest mage was super popular um but yeah like even the beast hunter stuff like beast hunter has some really cool powerful cards but like they're not broken Just, yeah yeah <laughs> if that makes sense yeah um so I think like with Hunter's hero power, the limiting thing is like in standard, dealing two damage with the hero power is actually a big deal. In wild, there's so much healing compared to the standard. You know, that's the big thing. Whether we're talking about like Zilliax, Healbot, Reno, um, <laughs> like there's so much more that players can do to kind of get that life game back that they can't in standard. So that, I think that's a big part of why the class doesn't transition because the two damage or three damage if you're playing odd doesn't translate as well. Um, and it really just needs ways to kind of really capitalize on that hero power, I think, when talking about even and odd. Mm -hmm. So things like Phase Stalker, things like Tour Guide, um, these kind of synergies to really make it so like, as long if you're dealing damage to the face, you're taking that time to do that. If you're not falling behind on board, then it's great. If you're doing like a two mana pass with the hero power, then that's really, really sad. Um, so yeah, it definitely does have these pieces. It just doesn't do anything that feels explicitly unfair. It doesn't control board or snowball boards aggressively enough 
um, with its aggressive decks that it can close out fast enough against aggro. It doesn't quite have a great time against other aggressive, sorry, have a, that it can't close out against control. And against aggro decks, it's not really equipped to really fight for board. So it just needs a little bit better in terms of early game. And I think we can get there. Um, but it does have some nice pieces overall. So we'll see. Yeah, I feel like we just need more cards like Crackling Razor Maw or Face Stalker and, and maybe Hunter, aggressive hunters at least have a have a chance. But we we're we're a bit away. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, for now, Hunter is kind of relegated to a uh, for fun class, as much as it hurts to say that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, let's talk a little bit about Mage. So Mage is like by far and away, and by by far when I mean like a percentage point or two, the most popular class <laughs> overall at Legend when you're looking at the VS sample, and it's the most popular when we're looking at our sample. Um, uh -huh. And for me, the reason for this is because you have four very, very solid, viable, competitive archetypes, right? Like, mm -hmm. while Mage is 21% of the metagame, no specific Mage deck is above, like, 9 or 10%. You have Quest Mage, that's super competitive. You have LPG Reno Mage, that's super competitive. You have Reno Quest Mage, you have Turtle Mage, uh, you even have Secret Mage, that's, like, not very popular, but still a very, very strong deck. Um, Mage, I think, is in a very, very, very good spot in Wild. Um, and so let's talk, we can talk a little bit about them. So Quest Mage, I think everybody expected Quest Mage to be a thing, right? post Dark Lair nerf as kind of like the supposed counter to Reno Priest. Um, you just probably shouldn't play it when there's a ton of aggressive archetypes, which is probably why I'm seeing a lot more Quest Mage than you are, because I'm not seeing all the Discord War like an Aggro Druid. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Quest Mage, I think, is just still very, very strong, very, very dominant in those slower matchups um just like it used to be uh and so unless there's some drastic change to sorcerer's apprentice or whatever i think quest mage is here for the long haul is like the counter to these these slow control or slow combo decks mm -hmm. um i know you like not to narrow too much into the game design and stuff i i know you personally have like a strong dislike for the random mechanic um mm -hmm. from the quest mage stuff but how do you feel about the type of deck that quest mage is a hold if you kind of exclude the randomness and you think of it more as like the turn six to eight combo deck. Is that something you're comfortable with in wild at that kind of speed for a, a finisher? Well, so regardless for me, of the... yeah, for me, combo decks, I think I'm okay with combo decks. I think you have to be fast enough at this point to bypass stuff like Lotheb and Dirty Rat and Elusia. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just kind of like the speed you have to be at. So like, I think turn eight Mechathene, turn nine Mechathene kills were like, that's like kind of the new normal. Um, for me, like the reason I didn't like Quest Mage pre-nerf was because Quest Mage was too good against the decks that were supposed to counter it, right? Which were the aggressive right. archetypes. Because if you're turn seven, turn eight killing people, you're giving up something against those aggressive matchups, or at least you're supposed mm -hmm. to. Um, and I think post-nerf Quest Mage does do that. It loses so much more to those aggressive yeah. strategies. So like, I think it's in an okay spot. Okay, as much mm -hmm. as I dislike yeah. the deck, I think it's you know a viable deck in the format, and I think it's a deck that we probably need in the metagame, right? So I'm mm -hmm. not, you know, too sad that it's there, but uh, otherwise we'd be seeing even more Priest, yeah. and I don't know which one I would like better. But I, like you said, my my main issue with the deck is, like, how it wins, not the fact that uh -huh. it's a deck that exists and wins, you know? Okay, so, like, beyond Quest Mage, though, we, we still have a ton of, like, other Mage archetypes, right? Like, there's a lot of variety in the class. Mage has been, along with Warlock, I think, probably... I think those two have been, like, the most varied and popular classes for some time in while. Mm -hmm. Um, next up, though, let's you know let's touch on Reno uh, LPG Mage. Um, Reno LPG Mage is a deck that um, we we have seen been dropping off. Like players were, it seems very excited to play it once the the you know the patch went live. But mm -hmm. uh, we've been seeing a slight decline in that recently. Um, LPG Mage is a deck that really can be built in a few different ways, but ultimately has become. I think mostly we've been seeing something relatively similar to like Turtle Mage, right? Like it's kind of like the Reno version of Turtle Mage. Uh, in some ways and it's kind of an interesting pattern where mage can do this right where it has like a reno secret mage or a reno turtle mage or reno quest mage where it kind of just gets to play relicologist in these established archetypes which is very funny to me um but yeah lpg mage i know you've been playing it a ton me out so what are your general thoughts on that yeah i think a lot of people were excited at least i was excited to pick it up post dark lair because um it was a deck that like it sucked against Dark Lair. It was not very good yeah. against Dark Lair. Um, and it's historically had a pretty good matchup into Priest because you have a ton of healing and you have Ice Block. Um, mm -hmm. I think the reason that we're seeing it kind of dip is that people are really struggling to find lists that 
I think a lot of people, myself included, kind of got baited into this like turtle package of infinite loops in the Reno deck, and that's kind of come at the expense of something that Reno Mage is supposed to be historically very, very good against, which is aggro, right? Like with Ice Block and the Reno package and um, all the AoE that Mage has had, it's historically been a very, very good anti-aggressive deck. And it's kind of struggling, I think, against stuff like Aggro Jude and Discard Warlock because the current builds uh, don't really have efficient, effective ways to answer them, at least like all the lists that I've been seeing on Twitter and, mm-hmm. and on Ladder. And so for me, th- I, there's really not an optimal list out there um, that's been settled on, and I think people are maybe giving up on it or picking up other decks um, as a way to still counter Priest while being okay against aggressive strategies and so i think it's less the fact that it's not a good deck but that like because the best list hasn't been found right people are just straying yeah. away from it for a little bit yeah that makes sense to me i think i think in theory lpg mage is something that i felt was probably going to be a bit of a sl- like a sleeper sort of like mm-hmm. i felt like before the nerfs went live it was one of the decks that i thought was going to be quite strong once the uh, meta kind of settled so the fact that it has been kind of falling from what we've been seeing and you know i think the general perception isn't that it's particularly strong um but i think that like you said could largely be build related so i'll be interested to see whether lpg mage can kind of find its footing um you know as, as things go ahead i'll definitely be playing it um and maybe yes <laughs> maybe we'll see um but yeah like you mentioned the, the dip in lpg is kind of coincided with the rise of another mage deck um Mm -hmm. and you freaking standard players always ruining our wild format so turtle mage has become super popular i think in standard at least it's Uh started garnering a lot of criticism and attention in standard um and so of course when a deck like that happens you see it adopted to wild because you just get to make it more degenerate than it already is when it comes to wild and so adding ice blocks and being just as oppressive against those slow control decks um it's you know just like quest mage it can struggle against this aggressive strategies but the dominance against mm-hmm. slower archetypes more than makes up for it like i think turtle mage is maybe one of the hardest counters to to quest or to arena priest mm-hmm. that i i've personally seen it just absolutely kind of demolishes that matchup um and i think I mean, that's a big part of why turtle mage is kind of kind of soared in popularity we we see this kind of dip in quest mage that's like at the same time that you're seeing this huge rise in turtle mage presence or uh dip in lpg lpg sorry that's what i meant yeah yeah, yeah. um i am yeah, really... uh, turtle mage yeah, sorry turtle mage is a yeah definitely an archetype that I've, i tested a lot mm-hmm. i i had a really good time kind of trying to refine that and um build something that's a lot closer to what people were using in standard and that players weren't playing as much in wild um traditionally like people have been using a lot of things like depth charge and doomsayer and i was like hey what if we played like firebrand and violet spellwing and stuff like that um but yeah total mage definitely seeing a little bit of a bump recently i don't know whether that'll level off um because you know like it's a new archetype right like sometimes these new archetypes like they get posted on twitter people net deck they see a pretty rapid um kind of uh, adoption from the play base and then they kind of level out or you know fall off uh, over time um but yeah total mage definitely a, a really nice counter to reno priest and stuff and you know the general rule of like hey what's broken it's standard let's come steal that and you know do a wild version <laughs> like that generally works out pretty well um and so yeah i think like total mage is a kind of a new archetype it, it's something that i know like you're talking about the frustration that a lot of players have been having i actually feel relatively comfortable with total mage i know it can be very annoying once it gets into that lock but while it's something that i think in standard seems like it's a little extreme um in, and in while it's not particularly fun to play against it is something that i'm kind of comfortable with at because it doesn't really get its thing online until like turn eight or nine. And I think in wild, those kind of lockouts at that stage of the game, like, uh, you know, they're not that much of an issue to me. Yeah, like like I mentioned, it's it's a combo deck for me. I, I kind of equate it yeah. to, to Freeze Mage of old, right? Where mm-hmm. you, you're just trying to survive against aggro until you can do your, your combo and automatically win the game. Um, and yeah, like we mentioned earlier, like, like turn eight, turn nine, like I'm okay with it. Um, like that's... The, I'm okay with that speed. I don't. I don't really know about its oppression level in standard, but in wild, there there are ways to potentially disrupt the combo. Right? You can dirty rat. There's boom pistol bully. Um, there there are options out there. Um, mm-hmm. And honestly, as the the control player in me kind of hates seeing this, yeah. like decks like this. But also, <laughs> I'm happy that decks like that exist because the amount of times that I've queued into somebody that's playing 
the greediest LPG mage or like uh -huh. Arena Priest with like I don't even want to talk about some of the cards that I've seen in Arena Priest lately, but <laughs> decks like that prevent the greedy control decks. And yeah. that's I'm okay with that. Um and I don't think it's completely out of line and wild. I think it's yeah, it's annoying as hell to play against and, and if it gets changed because it's standard, I won't be I won't mm. be mad. I'm I'm okay with it. Um yeah. But I also don't think it's like completely out of line of the other stupid things that you can do in this format. So I, I am not super like up in arms about Turtle Mage. Okay. Um, and, you know, we can't talk about Mage without at least touching on Secret Mage. Uh, Secret Mage has much, much lower representation than I think is really warranted. I think Secret Mage is actually um, continues to be a, a very, very solid deck that players, particularly at Legend, don't seem to want to play, but it seems to always be relatively popular um, at slightly lower ranks. So, I don't know, like, why doesn't it see play? Um, I, think, I think players feel like it drops off a lot uh, once players get better at sort of playing around secrets and stuff. Um, they also might be bored of the R-type in a lot of ways. It plays out very similarly to the way it played out last August, right? Like, back in Saviors of Oldham is when it went through this big, this big like, uh, makeover when it got Flak Mage and Ward um, and Cloud Prince. And since then, it's had very limited changes and stuff. I think Polk Out is a big new inclusion, but... You know, people don't seem to really want to adopt uh, and pick up Secret Mate as much, um, even at Legend. But I think it's still a very solid deck. Yeah, I think it has that syndrome that a lot of like the even and odd decks, like you know, start yeah. to have. Where, mm -hmm. well, dude, Odd Paladin's been a deck for two and a half years. I don't want to play Odd Paladin. Odd Paladin's boring at this point. <laughs> where like, yeah. for the past two and a half years, Odd Paladin's been up there for like one of the best decks in the format. Every time a report comes out, for the past two and a half years, right? Um, yeah, people might not be playing it, but that doesn't mean it's not a strong deck. I, I've picked up a little bit of Secret Mage. I've been doing a little bit of deck roulette, and Secret Mage has been, like, surprisingly effective. Because, um, mm -hmm. like, man, Flak Mage is a stupid card, dude. Flak Mage is yeah. such a dumb card, and I think, like, the, the presence, like, if you just go back to double Flame Wards and, and have the Flak Mage with the Arcane Mysteries, like... You should have like not terrible matchups into stuff like Paladin or um, even Shaman or Agro Druid nowadays, right? Yeah. Like it should it should hold its own against those matchups, and so mm -hmm. it is. It's been very surprising to me that Secret Mage hasn't been seeing more play, and I honestly think it's just because people might be bored of the deck, it. which is yeah, which is that okay. Happens. That's fair, and that's that's yeah. that's how it works. <laughs> um, sure. um. So yeah, let's move on to Paladin. Uh, Paladin's kind of always had this like super diverse range of decks that have not been like super OP. Right outside of Odd Paladin, uh, Mech Paladin had its little bit of time there, um, but Paladin, regardless of the archetype, all play out very similarly. They're all board-based decks that need to snowball their board advantage, and if they can't do that, they're not winning the game. Um, mm -hmm. And I, like, there's the only kind of exceptions have been like Uthro Decay and Anything Paladin, both of which are like not super relevant um, in the metagame. They haven't been for a little bit. Um, but let's talk about Odd Paladin. All Paladin's been a deck, like we mentioned, that's been a thing for two and a half years. It's been a good deck for two and a half years. Uh, a Chinese meta report just recently came out that claimed Odd Paladin is like the best deck in their format, which was a little bit surprising. Um, I mean, what are your opinions on Odd Paladin? For me, like Odd Paladin just feels like, I mean, Priest is still the most popular archetype in our server, right? Like, I don't, I don't know if Paladin can be the best deck in the format when Priest exists like at any popular clip i i think god paladin's really good like, I, I think it's I, good I, yeah but i don't know if yeah, it's best I, deck good i don't know if I, would, I agree i wouldn't i don't know if i'd go quite that far but um i think odd paladin for sure is like a deck that is very like we're talking about underrepresented decks with secret mm -hmm. mage like odd paladin's another one that's like right there with it where odd paladin got a massive upgrade man uh the christology and tour guide package as a whole um like that's busted it really is like the fact that you have like a tutor for your most powerful card and the fact that you did just get your most powerful card in tour guide um is really insane and like, such a significant overhaul for what the class for the what the r type is really you know mm -hmm. for for a long time odd paladin was kind of stuck it didn't really get major upgrades here and there so you know this is a big one um now odd paladin uh like Odd Paladin is, a, is an excellent counter to often unrefined stuff. So I know like often we talk about the most popular decks in the meta, right? We talk yeah. about, you know, the Rainer Priest, the Agro Druid, the Discard Warlock, the Quest Mage, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, there's always a very significant chunk of like unrefined off meta stuff that sees play, mm. even when talking about Legend and stuff. And I think Odd Paladin's a deck that really excels at beating up on a lot of those kind of archetypes. 
Um, yeah. And, you know, it's easy to forget. So, yeah, I think Odd Palin's really, really strong. Um, I think that a lot often, you know, a lot of the players, like we're talking about how, you know, how people influence the meta, all right? Like where people get their list from. I think a lot of the people where people get their list from aren't interested in Odd Paladin. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very unlikely to get neck decked from a stream or from Twitter because, um, you know, like not everyone wants to play Odd Paladin or, or watch Odd Paladin. Um, but it's very strong. I wasn't that shocked uh, overall, to be honest, that it was listed as the best deck from the Chinese meta report. Um, so we'll see whether it takes over ladder a little bit more. I know it did spark that meta report did spark some interest. Last time this happened, Dark Lair was everywhere. Um, maybe Odd Paladin's going to make up 30% of the game. I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll have to wait and see on that one. But yeah, Odd Paladin's in a great spot. And, you know, like Paladin as a whole feels like, even though it's very limited in its representation and these archetypes do play as similarly, it does have like a number of viable archetypes that it can go towards. Yeah, uh, so another viable archetype. Let's talk about Libram Paladin. So I think we talked a little bit about this last week, but a lot of other Libram Paladins that I've seen on ladder have like also completely transitioned away from this pure Paladin list. Uh, the 4 mana 4 two just, mm -hmm. while it's good, not good enough for Wild. Um, uh, and I think Standard has followed a similar approach, moving away from the pure Paladin stuff. Um, yeah. I think I Libra Paladin is a very good deck against other aggressive strategies um, with the ability to just pump out chains of taunts and use your Libra Wisdoms to make favorable trades up into other minions, which is really, really good. Um, I think the big issue right now with something like Libra Paladin is because it plays so much slower than Mech Paladin or, or Libra or, or Odd Paladin or Mech Paladin, like, it needs some way to close out games, right? Because against other control decks you're giving them time to find their their big haymakers their big aoe spells mm -hmm. and so you need a way to finish off the game and so like lanessa is kind of like that but it needs something else and so i know you mentioned a little bit about messing around with like a holy wrath like yeah. synergy um I don't, i'm not really sure how that list works or looks like but it needs something uh to be honest with you maybe honestly what if what if we put in yog as that finisher <laughs> I'm kidding, but it needs, uh, I mean, it needs something, that'll right? Finish, that'll finish the game one way or another. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it'll be a win for you, but yes. Um, odd, like, Leaping Paladin is something, you know, it's, it's very interesting, like, this parallel to Standard and Wild for Leaping Paladin, where whether it's the transition away from the pure list and this search, really, for this finishing, you know, like, you want this finisher ability to, to win without having board control because you're a little bit too slow, like you said, and if you lose that really uh, board control, you don't really have a great way to end the game. Um, so in standard, they've been looking at things like Avenging Wrath. I know that's a, it's a card people might not have heard from for a while. Um, Avenging even Wrath Paladin sort of play. Yeah, <laughs> even, even Paladin. I was about to say that. Yeah, um, even Paladin had a similar situation, right? Where mm. it was a very, very strong deck at kind of controlling board, but it had very limited reach. So standard players have kind of been reaching for that. Um, in Wild, uh, we have a little bit of a different option. We can play Thekel Molten Giant, which is a pretty strong combo by itself and we could throw in a shivala and then we play like polkel holy wrath i know it sounds like a lot of cards but i mean if you if you draw a holy wrath and then you you just play polkel it means the following turn you can just burst someone for 20 yeah. um and then the thekel makes the molten giants not necessarily useless if you draw them in other situations so i think that's a really nice idea as a way to try and have finishing power against a deck like priest um and it'll be interesting to see like whether labrum paladin can kind of find a way to kind of navigate this issue uh what's interesting to me is that like a lot of the hs replay info you know a lot, i know some people take that with a heavy grain of salt um but i think a lot of the hs replay info has been very positive on libra and Paladin. it's been um, for a for while some right? time now yeah yeah for some time now where i i totally understand why players have their reservations and even why it might have dropped off a little bit at high ranks right where at very high ranks uh, you know, because it does have these bad matchups like Reno Priest. But I think that Leaven Paladin is another deck that hasn't really caught on the way it probably should have um, in Wild. And I think, again, it's because really the way it plays out, where it feels kind of like you're not doing that anything insane, right? But the Librams are very, very powerful. Christology with the Eldor Attendant is really busted yeah. uh, for Wild exclusively. So, yeah, I think Leaven Paladin's a deck that players really should be messing around with a little bit more and actually has a lot of potential and looks really quite solid and underrated. Yeah, so definitely mess around with Libra Paladin moving forward, I think, is the, the big takeaway here. Um, but yeah, I mean, Paladin as a whole, I think winners or losers post Dark Lair. It's kind of hard to tell, honestly, outside of like people finally recognizing that All Paladin's still a very good deck. 
I would I would say it's a winner because it tended to struggle with that Dark Lair matchup. Mm-hmm. I think I think God Paladin's one of the winners overall. All right. Uh, so let's talk about Priest. Okay, Priest. We've, we when we've talked about all these other classes, we've talked about mul- multiple archetypes that they have. Uh, Priest is not like that. Priest has one deck, and nope. that one deck is Arena Priest, and it makes up like you, you see sixty percent Priest, like fifteen point five percent of that is Arena Priest. It's insane. Um, there's a little bit of Inner Fire Priest here and there. Um, which is probably going to fall off, sadly, because Cabal Acolyte got nerfed like two days after Corvette discovered the list. Um, oh. Yeah, so, I mean, Rena Priest, top dog. We've talked a lot about it, so I don't really want to talk too much more about it. Um, yeah. I think what's important to note is um, Big Priest is completely dead, uh, at least in Legend. I don't know how... We, don't, we have no way of really measuring its popularity outside of Legend, but Big Priest is dead, um, which leaves kind of like two big decks left in the format currently i think big shaman will talk a little bit about and key block um mm-hmm. like key block kind of a big deck and so so yeah i mean priest very one-dimensional um i think the list within rena priest are seeing i don't want to say experimentation there's a lot of jank flying around in legend at least in my experience kind of teching for specific matchups including the mirror and so i think there's a lot of I innovation like the... I like the distinction between experimentation and jank. I think that's an important one. Um, like something that looks like it could potentially be viable and stuff that kind of feels like a little bit of nonsense. Yeah, I, um, I've seen yeah, Rena right. Priest running psionic probes for for goodness sake. Like I don't even know what that card is. It, I think it's it's a one mana <laughs> card. Add a random copy of a minion in your opponent's deck to your hand, like yeah, for the, for the yeah. mirror. We could have like a bet on right now, and I would have be at a complete coin flip whether you were just kind of pulling my leg here. I don't know <laughs> if that card exists or not. I, I have seen it multiple times. I've seen like the new the new neutral card, Psychic Conjurer, right? It's like a one mana one one at a random minion. Like there, nope. <laughs> people are teching in the weirdest ways for for the for matchups, and so yeah. I think the experimentation is becoming less about archetypes within Priest and more within the specific Reader Priest list. Um, yeah. Do you, do you think it's just like players are players are bored, or do you think it's just like a, a desperate seeking to try and get an edge in the mirror and stuff like that? Well, see, I would argue the second if priest was more popular than it was, right? From what we're you, seeing, yeah. like priest is not the like it is the most dominant class, but not by far and away the most dominant class or uh, popular class, I should say. And yes. so, if, if it was forty percent, I completely understand, all right. And it's not jank; it's experimentation. But at this point, like I'm not, I'm not sure what and this. <laughs> And the thing is, like, this is not, like, low legend. This is, like, top 100 legend people running psych- psychic conjurers and psionic probes. And I'm just, like, my head hurts. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um, but yeah. um, well, speaking of head hurting, let's talk about the class that tries to hit you in the face. Let's, uh, do let's it. move to, to Rogue, I think. Ooh, good transition. Thank you, thank nice. you. I, I worked on that for days. Um, now, Rogue is a class with, you know, like, two decks, really. Uh, mm-hmm. It has Odd Rogue and Kingsbane. Um, they're both very similar. They both uh, point things at your head and hope that you die before they do. Um, now... They do have slight differences, right, um, in their overall matchup spread, um, where Odd Rogue tends to be very, very good at handling more mid rangey type of stuff, right? Like, it's very good into things kind of like uh, even Shaman is an example, or even like Murloc decks. I know they're not popular right now, but that kind of archetype seems to be a real strength for uh, Odd, Sha- Odd Rogue overall. I think I said Shaman, um, <laughs> but Odd Rogue overall. Uh, Kingsbane, however, um, is kind of like the glass cannon. Uh, it, it struggles a little bit more against the fastest archetypes or it can struggle um if it, if it is given the freedom to kind of punch the opponent in the face as much it, it's a lot more prone to weapon removal but overall they they feel similar um both decks have really kind of dropped off a little bit i think since the immediate patch uh kingsbane in particular i think is in a massive decline in play um ever since the patch and even a little bit before the patch uh odd rogue on the other hand i think I think Odd Rogue overall, we can see like in our line graph that we had earlier that Odd Rogue was still declining, but I I, I expect that to kind of change. I think yeah. Odd Rogue can be quite good as long as Odd Powder doesn't take over the way we were predicting the Doomsday uh, situation. Um, as long as that doesn't happen, I think Odd Rogue will come back with a bit of a force here. I think it's a very, very good deck and definitely, um, I think, how do you feel about the Secret Passage nerf? I, I feel like even that was under sort of underrated what kind of impact that would have yeah i know um, when we talked about it on our podcast we were like ah kingsman will be fine it'll it'll run the same yeah. 30 cards and while it's run the same 30 cards i was talking about this a little bit so kingsman is a deck where like it he- relies heavily on the synergy within its cards right like prep oil mm-hmm. or deckhand oil or something raiding party to, to 
to pop off with its damage. And because of that, going from five to four has a m much bigger impact than just like seeing one less card. That's a lot less combo potential with your cards that you are seeing. And so I think I completely underrated the impact that that card's nerf had on Kingsbane. Um, mm -hmm. I think you still have to play it because it's that like it's still a good card. Yeah. And it's better than any of the other options. But I think it hurts Kingsbane a lot, a lot more um, than I expected. I think honestly. Kingsbane has felt very mediocre to me in any yeah. matchup that's not Priest. And even against Priest, if they have a Zeph in their opening hand, like you're not winning that game. Um, because it, it feels like Kingsbane needs to have that explosive opener, turns two, turn three, and then finish you off with a Kingsbane. If you, if, you, if you just can't have that, then you're not winning games. And so I've been really kind of down on Kingsbane recently. Um, don't get me wrong, it's still a very good deck, but I, I hesitate to put it in like my top 10 if i had to make one if that makes sense but so, yeah i i'm right there with you like yeah. it, it doesn't feel that strong to me which is super interesting i think that before the patch actually happened i was already feeling a little bit um i remember like that i had that last comment in the last pod that we did where i was like uh i think odd warrior might be the third best deck at the time mm, um yeah. <laughs> and that might have been a bit extreme but i think it definitely indicated that i was already feeling a little bit down on kingsbane um as sort of like other decks were kind of finding their right build and other like kingsman felt very established sort of right out the gate like and it was new and it was exciting it was very popular um but as other decks mm -hmm. felt refined i felt like it was dropping and then the nerf kind of this accelerated things a lot i think it is it got very significantly hit um yeah so it's been interesting for sure yeah but we were talking a little about odd rogue and how you know it might be impacted by the, the rise of stuff like odd Paladin. and i think while Odrog has declined in play, I have been super happy with its like power level. It's been very good yeah. for me. It's been amazing against other aggressive strategies, right? Um, whether it be Pirate Warrior or King's Main Rogues. Um, and with the ability to like run one beneath grounds or two, like I've been holding my own against like Reiner Priest as well. Uh, the big thing that I've struggled with with Odrog has been key block, uh, and that's been like kind of a historical oh. struggle for the deck. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I think. If Odd Paladin rises like we expected to, I think actually Odd Rogue has, you know, an easier way of adapting to the rise of Odd Paladin than maybe some of the other meta aggressive decks because you get to include stuff like Magic Carpet and Evil Miscreant back again. Um could, uh, could even go over the Skulker, Skulker if things yeah. do actually happen, but uh we'll see. I don't I don't know if we need to go that far, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll see as the meta plays out, but I mean I'm just putting that out there. It's like if Odd Paladin rises in, in popularity odd rogue has the ability to adapt so i don't think yeah. that it's going anywhere anytime soon and it's been really strong um and i think like we talked about a little bit it's been kind of underplayed a little bit recently um and i'm not sure why that is but it's it's been very very good for me and i've been very happy with odd rogue so i, I definitely put that as like i think rogue in general kingsbane was a loser post dark Lair nerf but i think odd rogue was a huge winner um in general as like I think it's up there with Discard Warlock and Aggro Dude as like the best aggressive decks, like the three best aggressive decks in the metagame. And so uh, I consider that a win for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, let's talk about Shaman. So uh, if you notice that Shaman, you know, wasn't on, like when we're looking at Shaman archetypes, none of them really showed up in our, in our pie chart. None of them were in like the top 15, 20 archetypes in terms of popularity, but Shaman as a whole is still very, very relevant. It has representation. It's just very diverse in its archetype distribution. So we're not really noticing one specific deck that's super popular. Um, and so I have four decks here that I want to talk a little bit about. So first of all, Odd Shaman. Um, so this is the Shaman archetype that um, has been looking the most promising. It's been seeing the most play, I think. Uh, so shout outs to Anero and Blue Train for kind of championing this deck. It's, uh, it, it looks it looks good. <laughs> like it looks like a real deck that's yeah. here to stay. Um, honestly, the more I'm looking at it and playing the deck and playing against the deck, it feels more like the next incarnation of Aggro Shaman, right? Like, I don't think we're going to get... You kind of know how, like, mid-range Dude Paladin kind of died for Odd Paladin. It feels yeah. like Aggro Shaman's, you know, eventually going to die and be replaced by Odd Shaman because it just, it just, it feels really, really good. It plays really, really smoothly. And, uh, and yeah, I, I don't think it's going anywhere. Odd Shaman is no longer a meme. 
Man, that feels so strange. <laughs> like that, 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 it's like right up there with Beast Priest, you know, when when Twitch is sort of requesting these insane archetypes. Yeah. It's like I'll play Odd Shaman. Um, but no, it's real. It's it's real. It got a lot of support recently. Um, as you were saying, like none of the shaman archetypes made it. They all got lumped in with the others. A very very sad tale for shaman. But it did have like a number of a number of archetypes that were right there. You know, I had to cut off like when making the charts and stuff. I kind of cut it off at some point. Um, shaman had like a whole bunch of class, a whole bunch of archetypes that were like just on the cusp of being mm -hmm. shown. Um, so it is saying like a little bit of play, right? Like the overall class representation isn't um, you know. It's not, it's not hunter and uh, you know demon hunter tier, right? Like shaman, we're seeing nearly at five percent of the meta. Uh, it actually sees more play than paladin overall for us mm -hmm. on and on the BS uh, chart as well, um, with a number of uh, solid archetypes. Um, so yeah, old shaman seems really solid right now. Um, big shaman, um, we're talking about one archetype being aggressive. Well, big shaman is kind of like the weird control shaman, but not really. It's kind of mm -hmm. weird, like that. Um, where big shaman is very much uh, limited by priest like it, it's got a real cap on how it can perform because my god it sucks in that matchup it it oh it, that feels so sad if you're playing big shaman and you're doing sabrina priest but you know it still maintains really good stuff into other aggressive decks um you know it's very it has a lot of healing a lot has a aoe uh, it cheats out these big taunts that can be very annoying so i think big shaman is another deck like um like old shaman like even shaman and so on that is a little bit underplayed and actually has like uh like a lot of potential and if anything ever happens to priest <clears throat> um <laughs> big shaman could definitely see a rise i think fingers crossed yeah i mean okay speaking of anti-aggressive decks um uh, let's also talk about like even shaman right even shaman is yeah. historically it's always been the anti-aggressive aggressive deck right whenever people were preparing tournament lineups or talking about well how do i beat aggro like even shaman has always been like the answer to that question i don't know if that's true i'm gonna be honest with you i don't I'm not 100% sold on that moniker anymore for even Shaman, but it's still a very good aggressive deck against other aggressive strategies, right? Because you still have mm -hmm. Lurker Below, you have Maelstrom Portal, you have Devolve, like you still have stupid Shaman cards that are good. Um, uh -huh. And I don't know why people have completely abandoned even Shaman. I, like, I know Rena Priest is an abysmal matchup, but Rena Priest is an abysmal matchup for a bunch of the decks that are still seeing play, so I don't really know where it's gone. Um, but I think if Odd Paladin increases in... like presence in the metagame and if odd odd rogue is very good in the metagame even shaman should be right up there with it i think in my opinion yeah um it just might be having baku gen syndrome right yeah. where it didn't get anything that looks completely new and completely re revamped the class and therefore why are we playing it yeah. um i do think it did get some uh, like a small upgrade with like uh the panthera uh the yeah. two three drawer card if you hear about and i know you've personally liked note keeper i believe it's called i've been messing uh, around with it a little bit yeah yeah, uh, even Shaman is a deck that I've been playing a little bit here and there, and it feels very solid. Like, I think it's actually quite decent. Um, but, you know, like, it, you're saying, like, the other decks are seeing play that it kind of suck into Priest. I think even Shaman is one of the absolute worst ones into Priest. Yeah. Like, I think, like, if you're Discard Warlock, if you're Aggro Druid, if you're Odd Rogue, I think you've got a lot more game into Arena Priest than if you're even Shaman. That's fine. Um, yeah. Whereas that's, that's, that's a lot closer to, like, a 75 25. Like, that's a really feels bad matchup. Um, and so I totally understand why people might have you know being pushed away from that archetype overall um but yeah i i think even shaman's quite solid and another one of these popular sorry un, one another one of these underplayed but yeah. viable archetypes for shaman i will say though like as bad as it is into ringer priest it is so good into stuff like odd paladin and even shaman that yeah like maybe that oh, more than shaman? makes up for it or Agro Druid, sorry. And Ag Agro Druid, yes. yeah, sorry, sorry. I was like, well, we're talking about even shaman my brain's not uh, working yeah, i was like i don't know if it's better than 50 50 in the mirror <laughs> but we'll see but like it, it absolutely demolishes the aggro Dune matchup, and it's it's historically been very favorable into into odd paladin, and so, I mean, I think it might. Yeah, that's a, that's really weird to say about even shaman about it being like a coin flip matchup deck, but it might be its role in the metagame, right? Where you like lose all the arena priest Q and two, but beat all the other aggressive matchups. So, who knows? The um, uh, new odd warrior. Who would have thought? <laughs> um, speaking of, of you know decks that nobody knows what anybody's doing like reno shaman holy crap like the fact that it showed up first of all in our mm. sample size at top 100 legend is absolutely insane because i i don't even know what reno shaman tries to do other than play shaman play shutterwalk and then like reno because i've never seen one actually be able to pull off its win condition because it's been that bad um yeah and so 
I don't, I don't know what's going on with Reno Shaman. I don't know what the game plan is with Reno Shaman. Um, but I have seen a surprising amount of it. And so, like, I don't know. Let me know what's happening. Um, I, I, that's all I got to say, dude. I don't, I don't know what's going on with Reno Shaman. Is that a question from me? Because I don't really have the answer on that one. Um, I don't hey, know. those of you in the audience that are listening... <laughs> I don't, if you guys know what Reno Shaman's going on, like what the plan is with that deck, let us know in the comments. Um, okay, so let's let's touch on Warlock, guys. Uh, now, Warlock has a ton of options. Um, however, this card is, of course, the front and center right now uh, after the post Dark Lair nerf. Mm -hmm. uh, Warlock has continued chugging, like really not really slowing down too much. One of the most popular classes overall. Still being Warlock and Wild, you know, Warlock and Mage, they're always the most diverse, always the most popular, the most viable archetypes, all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, Discard, very, very strong. It's kind of become the well i know again you've had slightly different experiences but for me and for our overall stats it looks like discard warlock is largely the default uh aggro deck aggro deck of choice um however warlock as a whole i i think has um well i mean it's been a mixed bag right like the the rise of reno priest uh since the expansion has kind of like locked out some of the slower warlock archetypes uh, it's been a very very significant weakness for warlock for a long time mm -hmm. the well, really, it's one card, Psychic Scream. Yeah. Uh, Psychic Scream kind of causes absolute hell for these slow Warlock archetypes, whether we're yeah. talking about Cube Lock, Even Lock, Reno Lock. Um, there's a lot of options here, and they all kind of like basically die inside when the Priest gets a seven mana. Um, <laughs> however, you know, Cube Lock picked mm -hmm. up an interesting little inclusion recently with Willow. Um, even Warlock got a ton of support, but still hasn't really been able to take off. Um, and so, yeah, Warlock is still relatively diverse. You have options. Um, and you know, and discard warlock is kind of sort of picked up a little bit where dark Lair left off. Yeah. I think we're talking about slower warlock archetypes. I think all three of them are going to be very good into stuff like aggro druid or odd rogue or odd paladin, just because like warlock AOE is very good against those kind of archetypes. Um, but like you mentioned, it, it's just another one of those decks where like, you hate to see priest. You just absolutely hate to see priest. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just going to kind of be the role in the metagame. I think Cube Lock has got the edge on stuff like Even Lock and Reno Lock um, because of the fact that it has a decent matchup um, into Quest Mage as well, whereas the other two don't really have that. Um, and I, I will say, Reno Lock feels like it's just... I, this is coming from a guy who's played thousands and thousands of game games of Reno Lock. It is so far behind Reno Priest yeah. and, and Reno Mage at this point just because it hasn't. it feels like it hasn't gotten it's, a super powerful feels, tool in a couple... It, couple expansions it just feels too fair compared to the other two it too feels slow. so much closer to reno shaman than reno priest which like, is that's, insane that's it's I, insane yeah it, right? yeah um so like it it just feels like it's win conditions are being a control deck rather than like a combo finisher like the other two have um which i think yeah. is like the big thing which is why i think if you are playing reno lock you have to play like at least the leroy combo you have to be some sort of proactive um Honestly, I don't I don't know if anybody's messed around with like a like cruel Reno Lock with like the newly buffed Willow because like maybe that's the way you play proactive Reno Lock nowadays. I don't know, um, but yeah, slower slower Warlocks are severely limited by Priest. Um, and then the last but not least for Warlock, uh, <laughs> there's a little little archetype here, a little note to talk about the deck that died, the deck that shall but not be named, but uh, this this guy down here has resurrected it so you guys go at him on twitter and yell at him about how this deck is back no i don't do that um <laughs> no but dark Lair warlock um i don't know we we kind of got an idea quickly that it might not be entirely dead <laughs> um and while it's seeing very very limited play in what we saw right like when we went through all our stats it's still there um it's still it's still there i've been playing a little bit here and there and actually had quite a bit of success with it it turns out playing multiple four eight multiple like eight eights on turn four um still strong you know fun facts still strong um so i've been playing the exact same list that i was playing like pre-nerf like card for card 30 for 30 um and it's been very very solid for me um but yeah i don't really know about dark Lair warlock um about whether it actually is strong or that whether it's just like a small sample of high roll. Uh, I'd be interested to see. Uh, Dark Lair itself as a card has been picked up a little bit here and there in Discard Warlock. Um, interestingly, most Discard Warlocks are actually not playing Dark Lair mm -hmm. um, on ladder as a whole, but I know a number of people that have really been using that package in Discard. Um, but whether the the pure Dark Lair list, right? The the cult, the, the sense demons and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm, I'm super interested to see whether it makes a comeback. Uh, and a little terrified at the same time. Do you think Dark Lair might serve that same role 
or like be in that same position rather that like quest mage was like post nerf where like it was absolutely meta defining and then it got nerfed and post nerf it's still a playable deck that fills some specific role in the metagame like and while it might not be as popular or as strong as quest mage like it it might still serve a purpose yeah um quest mage after it got nerfed there was such a resounding sentiment that the nerf did nothing um, you know, I don't think that was particularly true, right? Like, personally, I thought the, que- the nerf was actually very, very significant. I think it has proven to be significant nerf, right? Yes, yeah. a- a- absolutely. Um, and so uh, for, with Dark Lair, it's different, right? Like, people felt like the deck was dead, you know, like, yeah. for the most part. Um, and so I don't know, really, whether, whether it's going to have that kind of resurrection. Um, it feels very strange. Like, uh, Dark Lair Warlock because it doesn't really like have the incredible clear counters the way quest mage does like it didn't really matter for quest mage in some matchups that it got nerfed that much like it still had very strong favorables and so it felt like he was still doing very unfair things sometimes dark Lair warlock um had a matchup spread that was a lot more even uh even keeled right like sometimes you kind of just bricked and lost to aggro most of the time you won but sometimes you did <laughs> um and so yeah whether like dark Lair comes back or not uh, i really don't know um, I think it's still like a, a very powerful card. I know that it's seen limited success in standard. Um, like overall, it's been very, very weak in standard, the Zoo Warlock that was playing Dark Lair there. But at the same time, um, a couple of players have hit like rank one legend with it. Uh, and it's, so it seems like you can still kind of high roll. That still seems like there's something there. Um, and yeah, I'm just a little terrified of what might be down the road on Dark Lair Warlock and cheating out Flesh Giants on turn four and stuff. So you're saying time will tell. Uh, we'll come back to this I'm next a- month. We'll come back to this next month and we'll see. I, I, ho- I hope we don't have to have this conversation <laughs> next month. <laughs> yeah, true, true, true. All right, and last but not least, I know we've been going for a little bit, guys, but uh, last but not least, we're almost here, uh, Warriors. So during the Dark Lair metagame, people, myself included, I'll, I'll admit, were kind of hailing Warriors like the savior. It was like the off-meta, you know, Dead Man's Hand and Rage Warrior, whatever deck you want to call it, um, even Odd Warrior was seen as the savior as like the counter to dark lair um and now and now that dark lair has been nerfed and you're seeing the rise back of all these other decks warrior has kind of fallen off a cliff it's it's died mm-hmm. back in the format it had it's like three weeks of fame um away from the bottom of the metagame and, and now it's back there um dead man's hand and all warrior are both like very very slow decks that now feel like they don't counter anything anymore right other than odd warrior being it's traditional like I, I beat aggro and nothing else. Like it doesn't feel like those two decks are very powerful because there's other decks that do that but better and more consistently in other matchups. Yeah, they have a they maintain like very limited presence. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, I think we've been talking about winners and losers, and I think Warrior is like almost as big of a loser as Dark Lair itself. Hell, it seems like Dark Lair might actually have won out more than Warrior <laughs> somehow um, <laughs> from the Dark Lair nerf, which is interesting. Um, but yes. Uh, you know, Warrior, it had its little moment, right? Like you were saying, as the counter deck, as the is the off-meta darling. Um, and now it kind of doesn't really have that role anymore. Um, it's not really picking on the one matchup that was dominating the entire meta the way it was previously. Um, now, Warrior as a whole, like, it has this very powerful package, right? It, it always has this powerful skipper package, this, mm-hmm. this like, really great anti-aggro armor gaining thing that it can do. Um, but it really hasn't got a clear win condition, right? Bombs aren't fantastic. DMH is not fantastic. They, these aren't the things that you really want to be doing in Wild. And so while it does have this shell, um, it doesn't really quite have the pieces there. So I will be interested in seeing whether Warrior ever quite gets there in Wild, um, yeah, as whether it's able to really find that easy win condition, that that consistent, simple win condition that it needs to be able to kind of close out these, uh, these slower matchups uh, quite easily. Um, Odd Warrior, on the other hand, you know, it, it is what it is. It's like beat aggro, lose to not aggro. It's same old, same old. It's really yeah. completely <laughs> dependent on what you're seeing. Um, Pirate Warrior, um, I feel like Pirate Warrior is seeing a little bit of a resurgence with the wrench caliber. Um, yeah. At the same time, though, like very, very limited play, right? Like very limited play, but I personally played it a little bit here and there and it's felt fine. So I'd be interested to see, especially with King's Bane nerf, whether Pirate Warrior gets a little bit more of an edge and picks up over time. Yeah, so I've been playing a little bit of Pirate Warrior myself, and kind of my main reason behind picking Pirate Warrior back up was um, while I'm not seeing a ton of stuff like Aggro Dude and Discard Warlock, it gave me a little bit more flexibility for other aggressive decks that I wanted to play. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's maybe something that you might not have been afforded because Discard Warlock and Aggro Dude were super popular, um, and that those <laughs> matchups feel like 
they probably suck for Pirate Warrior. Uh, but for me, Pirate Warrior has historically been like amazing against Quest Mage, and that's still the case. Um, whereas the Wrench Caliber has felt like one of the... You talked a little bit about how like the bomb in Rage Warrior stuff just like it sucked. And I think the main reason yeah. that it sucked was because it beat Priest, but like nothing else. Where like Pirate Warrior yeah. with the Wrench Calibers can beat Priest and can still beat other decks, right? So I think that's kind of where Pirate Warrior sees play. Um, I don't I don't know how, how good it'll be. Um, and then the last deck I want to talk a little bit about is Galakrond Warrior. So like Chinese meta reports have always put Galakrond Warrior as this like tier one, tier two deck. And I honestly yeah. like I still I think it's the biggest bait. I, I it it just never seems to be a good deck on the america server at least and i don't i don't know if you've had a ton of success with it but for me it just felt like the worst pirate warrior in, in a lot of situations mm-hmm. um and so i don't i don't know what list they're playing because they seem like the same list that i'm running and a lot of other people are running and it's just not very good so um yeah it's specific list i'm not entirely sure i've seen a lot of like corker and elite and that kind of thing um, but I don't know exactly like 30 for 30 what has been played. Um, I do think that Galakrom Warrior is, I, I think it's okay. Like, I think it's pretty decent overall. Um, it's very, very strong often into, uh, aggressive archetypes. Um, okay. traditionally, I, a big reason why the Chinese players loved it, um, for a significant stretch of time there was because it was seen as sort of the big counter to even Shaman yeah, while having a relatively okay matchup into slower archetypes. Um, and so, yeah, I felt kind of okay about Galakrond. I'm not saying it's one of the best decks in the format, but it did pick up like Polkelt, which I think is quite significant. Being able to put that Galakrond mm, to the top of the deck and have like true. the third tutor, the third tutor really for Galakrond, where you're playing Galakrond, Kronks, Polkelt um, as, a, as a trio. Um, making that very consistent is quite good. So yeah, Galakrond Warrior, uh, it's kind of like an offshoot, like an off-brand Pirate Warrior. But if you want to be a hipster and... Well, I mean, hell, if you want to be a hipster, you can play Pirate Warriors <laughs> um, at, at this point. But yeah, I mean, Galakrond Warrior is another option that players can have uh, if they want to go down that kind of route and play something that's a little bit mid-rangey. This idea of Polkelt and Galakrond. I have rogue yes. ideas. I have rogue ideas. Ooh, mm-hmm. I'd like to... Okay, we'll, we'll see. Put you in the lab and we'll see what uh, you figure out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think Warriors the whole... Big, big losers, like we mentioned. It... It's just kind of completely fallen off a cliff. I, it used to be the third most popular class, and now it's just kind of gone um, back to where it used to be. As for the longest time, it was like Pirate Warrior was the only archetype that was ever seeing play, and uh, mm-hmm. even now that Pirate Warrior is kind of dead again, it's Warrior Warrior is back to being dead class alongside Hunter and now Demon Hunter, which is a little bit sad to see. Um, yeah, but yeah, I I mean, as a whole, I think the meta has changed a lot in just two and a half weeks post Dark Lair, mm-hmm. and I think. For the better, for sure. Um, yep. Definitely. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that'll be it for t- uh, for us today. I-, I know it's a little bit longer episode than we normally do, um, mm-hmm. but this is only happening once in a month. And uh, I-, I think it's it's a lot of fun, at least personally, going through and digging through our, our sample sizes and our-, and our games and seeing kind of how the meta has shifted and what it's doing. Um, but yeah, we'll be back to our normal State of the Wild episodes next Sunday uh, and more in-depth episodes like this at the end of every month. Uh, Mm -hmm. if you guys enjoyed episodes like this let us know in the comments Uh, drop a like tell us what you liked about it what you want to what do you want us to do better and make sure you guys share it with others yeah definitely down to see all the feedback and stuff considering this was a bit of a different show than what we usually do Mm -hmm. Um, going through the data and everything was really interesting I had a lot of fun with it (laughs) as kind of geeky as that sounds Corbett Um, is the biggest nerd when it comes to this stuff by the way you guys when we were (laughs) when we were setting up for the show like the excitement in Corbett's voice, and he was like, "Dude, the drop in LPG mage, and like the rise of turtle." Oh my god! And he was he was so excited. It was a, so cute. It's a strange it's a strange life. Like, <laughs> Corbett's the biggest data nerd, and it's amazing. Um, but yeah, <laughs> as we wrap up, guys, just a reminder that we're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all your other podcast distributors. Uh, so if you guys would like to listen on the go, make sure you guys check us out there. Corbett, thanks again for joining me. Uh, let the people know where they can find you. Guys, you can find me at Corbett Games on uh, Twitch, Twitter, um, <clears throat> YouTube sometimes. Um, so you guys can One click day. on and check out all that kind of stuff. Um, streaming pretty much every day. Uh, so yeah, come tune in, guys. Uh, currently trying to make a push for rank one. We'll see. Um, but yeah, see you guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. This is really, really fun. Yeah, we appreciate you guys watching. Hope you all enjoyed. Uh, and stay safe out there. We'll see you guys next week. Later. All right, see you guys. Bye.